بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا وملائنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه في الأولين وصل وسلم وبارك عليه في الآخرين وصل وسلم وبارك عليه في الملأ الأعلى إلى يوم الدين we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His infinite wisdom and in His infinite mercy and peace and blessings upon our beloved Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon us. We ask Allah jalla wa ala to have mercy upon our parents. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to spread mercy upon those brothers and sisters across the world who are facing great hardship. May Allah jalla wa ala have mercy upon them forgive their sins, and remove the hardships from upon them in the light of So last week we started discussing three, one of the three events that are a precursor to the coming of the Prophet Last week we were introduced to the story of Abu Muqalib and Zamzam, and how Abu Muqalib rediscovered Zamzam by having that dream that was placed in his sleep, and he saw to dig up them. And we extracted necessary lessons from that story, and it was an introduction to number one, the increase in the status of Abdul Muqadid in the Quraysh society. Abdul Muqadid is who? He's the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this clearly was one notch that really put him up there as someone who's unique. Plus, it was a soft introduction to divine presence and intervention. How Abdul Muttalib is now someone who was given an ilham, who was given this dream to go and dig up Zamzam, and it was exactly where the dream had told him. So these had unique factors and unique features that we discussed in just last time. The second event that we're going to talk about is an event that is actually related to the first one. In the first event with, uh, with Zamzam and Abdul Muttalib, we remember that when Abdul Muttalib was striking Zamzam, he had just one son. Right? Just one son. And when Zamzam had broken, the people came, the people of Quraysh came, they started challenging him, we want to as well be authorities on Zamzam. At that moment, this is something we didn't mention last time, but it's relevant to this story, Abdul Muttalib he made a nether. A nether is a promise. He made a promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Ya Allah, if you were to grant me ten boys, ten boys, I will slaughter one of those boys in your way. Okay? Now, the reason why he asked for those boys was he was weak. He felt weak. And he felt that when the people came to intimidate him or to challenge him in his position as the one having found Zamzam, he felt that he was in a weak state. But there would be nothing more profoundly powerful than to have boys. And that's something that the Arabs really sought and yearned for, was boys, not just from the perspective of you know, recognition or uh, you know, a sense of stature, but rather it was also a practical thing that if you had boys with you, they could protect you and they could stand up behind you when, they, when you needed them. And so that's why he made that dua. Now, if we're to fast forward maybe three, four decades, the narration you know, say this happened when Abu Muqadil was around 40 when he made this dua. So this maybe is around the age of 70, let's say. At the age of 70, it so has that Abu Muqadil has 10 boys. And the promise, this nether that he made, he made it in private. No one knew of the promise that he made except him. So now Abu Muqadil is in the Mecca society. People clearly regard him and respect him, especially after Zemzam. He has these 10 powerful boys, and he remembers the promise that he made to Allah. And so he says, I have to, I have to slaughter one of them. So he gathers the 10 boys and takes them to the Kaaba, and he says, I made this promise to Allah decades ago, I have to fulfill it today. He draws a straw between the 10, ten boys, draws arrows, whatever. And the one who came out was the youngest of his sons. And the most beloved to his heart, Abdullah. Abdullah is the father of Muhammad So this 
spreads like a wildfire. As soon as Abdullah is chosen, and Abu Muhammad is literally sharpening his knife, people, this is happening around the Kaaba, so people start scurrying around, running from place to place, yelling to everybody, Abu Muhammad is in the Kaaba, he's around the Kaaba, and he's about to slaughter one of his boys. This was insane to them. So people started rushing to the Kaaba, rushing to Abu Muhammad, and telling him, you cannot do this. If you do this, you will create chaos. This is not a practice that we're familiar with. No one slaughters a boy. You can't slaughter a boy. Slaughter a girl. You know, that wasn't a practice. You know, we, we, we discredit it and we find it despicable, but that wasn't a practice. Slaughter a girl, yes, but not a boy. Because a boy meant a lot to them. And so, they start to offer him They'll say, we'll give you whatever blood money you want. We'll, give, we'll, we'll send in the way of Abdullah as much money as possible, but please do not do this. So he begins to feel a bit pressure. They keep on warning him about the evil that may come. They offer him all this. So he says, okay, I'll agree. We'll go to a kadi, a soothsayer in Yathrib. And that soothsayer will tell us, just like in Zemzam, when they, went to, they were going towards Kadi and Balisa, this time, we'll go to a kadi in Yathrib. Yathrib is a so they go to the soothsayer Medina, and the soothsayer says, Okay, go back to Mecca, and on one arrow, or on one piece, write ten camels, and on the other write Abdullah. And you keep on drawing. If the first time you draw ten camels, then just slaughter ten camels, and that is suffices for Allah. That suffices. You have fulfilled your duty. If you draw Abdullah, then keep on drawing until you draw ten camels. So they keep on drawing and each time Abdullah, 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 until it reaches a hundred camels. And when it reaches a hundred, finally, it, it draws on the arrow, so Abdullah is safe. So that people can get excited and say, okay, okay, fine, that's it. You drew now, all you have to do is slaughter a hundred camels. Abdullah, Abu Talib is not convinced, so he keeps on drawing and drawing, but each time he draws Abdullah's safe, so he says, fine, 100 seems to be the number. And so he slaughters 100 camels. The people of Quraysh all eat from these 100 camels. I'm going to explain why this is significant in a moment. So what are some of the takeaways? So at that point, thoughts, Abdullah is safe, they slaughter the 100 camels, and Abdullah uh, Abdul Muttalib decides that he wants to get Abdullah married and he goes and he looks for the best bride for him and he chooses Amina bint Wahab who was from Banu Zuhra and she was the gem of the society and they get married and we'll get to that next week when we talk about the birth of the Prophet. But for our sake, what are some of the takeaways from this one event? Number one, this tells us something about the character of Abdul Muttalib. Abu Muhammad is clearly, clearly a distinguished man, a man of honor and a man of dignity. He made an oath to Allah by himself. No one heard him make this oath. No one saw him make this oath. It's not that someone came to him threatening him, telling him, you made that oath, you better fulfill it. He, by himself, decides to say, I must fulfill the oath that I made. The promise that I made to Allah must be fulfilled. So that requires a certain type of man, a certain type of man with honor, someone who stands by their word to fulfill the promise of Allah, the promise that he made to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, when the Prophet tells us, I have not been set except to perfect the best of character, this is the kind of character that we need to learn from. The character of Abu Muqadr. Because he was undoubtedly a man of dignity and of honor and a man of sidq, a man of truth. And the Prophet said is as well, a salik al This is a trait that was inherited in his bloodline from Hashim, the father of Abu Muqalib, to Abu Muqalib, to Abdullah, to the Prophet A people of virtue, people of dignity, people of honor and a people of sidq, truth. Brothers and sisters, we as Muslims must be a people who stand by their word. The Prophet teaches us what? Ayat munafiq that the sign of a munafiq, a hypocrite, is three. Either hadatha, if he speaks, he lies. 
And if he's entrusted, he betrays his trust. And if he promises, he turns back on his promise. These are the signs of a munafiq. I want us to seriously ask ourselves, how many of us engage in these kind of character? You know, we, we almost now, it's become a joke in our communities. The worst doctors, the worst school, the worst uh, you know, mechanics, the worst electricians, the worst I don't know what, the worst everything, Muslim, 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 Muslim. You can't trust them. You know what? Go to a Jewish shop, you'll be much better. This is not, this is not, everyone knows this joke. Everyone is familiar with this, this ism or whatever. Is this not a travesty that not only do we engage in this kind of practice, but we become popular for it? And I, and I want us to be very careful about something. You know, psychologists point out that sometimes when you hear advice or something, there's this psychological deflection that as soon as I hear about it, no, no, it's not me, but I know people who are like that. You know, yeah, yeah, that person, yeah, definitely, they do that. And that person, oh, they definitely, oh, I know, I know a bunch of people who are like this. You're right, yeah, yeah, these people need to stop. But how many of us actually assess, are we people of our word? Are we people that we stand by our word? Is the Muslim community a community known that if they speak, they promise they will fulfill? This is something that we have to consider. Because the Prophet Sallallahu has explained to us extensively the dangers of the tongue. And where the tongue places you. You know, one hadith, have people not been thrown on their faces in Jahannam except for what their tongues have reached? Our tongues take us straight to Jahannam. And they force us to fall on our faces and be dragged. The Prophet says, promise me, protect from me what is between your legs and we keep your jaws and I'll guarantee gender for you. So brothers and sisters, do not take lightly for a moment the power that our words can have. Because for Abu Muqadid, look at this. For Abu Muqadid, not only was he internally and with himself a virtuous man, but when he spoke and when he promised and when he fulfilled, people were absolutely confident this is a man of dignity. This is a man of trust. He fulfills his promises and oaths. So not only does it have a personal uh, positive effect, but it definitely has a social effect that is extremely positive. And so I, I don't want to go too far on this, but it is very important that we learn from these at hand. The second lesson to be learned from this instance before we move on to the third event is that we have to understand when this was occurring. So Abu Talib is on Sar Abdullah. There's a frenzy that happens in the Meccan society. Everyone, you can say, becomes obsessed with Abu Talib and his son Abdullah. All people here is what? Abdullah, 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 Abu Talib. Abu Talib is going to do this, Abdullah. Abdullah becomes a household name. Everyone knows him. No one can deny him. No one can deny that Abdullah exists and that his lineage is there. Son of Abu Talib, son of Hashim. And this is important because Allah makes it that there is no excuse that you cannot believe. You know, you may claim that, oh, you know, this Prophet Muhammad, he came from some place where we're not aware he came from some qabila, some tribe that lives in the desert somewhere. No, no, no. Muhammad is from city center, Manhattan. He is the son of the most recognized figure. And plus, to emphasize that even more, this incident happens. So everybody knows about Abdullah. And everyone ate from the 100 camels that were slaughtered for Abdullah. Right? You just don't deny it. And that's one of the things in our theology that we believe, is that Allah Jalla wa will make it that his prophets and messengers, there is nothing in them that can be as an excuse for you not to believe in them, even their looks. So we believe that the prophets and the messengers of Allah are all good looking. And by good looking, I mean that they are pleasant to look at. They have no visible scars or marks that will make people say, oh, I can't believe in him. So even in this regard, the Nessa, the lineage of the Prophet, is clear and preserved. So we see that from the incident of Abu Talib and Zemzem, and all of the, the, the frenzy that happened at that point, now it's only increasing. And the focus on Abu Talib and his son Abdullah are paramount at this point.
Now we move on to the third issue. We're going to speak more about these kind of issues when we speak about the nesab of the Prophet ﷺ next week. So we learn who is Abu Muqalib, who is Abdullah, who is his Amina, who is Hajj, who is Sulaim, who are these people in his lineage, and why is this significant in the birth of the Prophet next week, inshallah. The third event that we have, and this is the event that, you know, it's, it's kind of a Sunday school event. Everybody knows about it. The event of the Hadith of al fi Abraha and the Elephants. And the destruction of Abra and his elephants. Or Abra. This event, to really appreciate it, you have to go back to Yemen. Yemen, we mentioned a few lessons ago, was a very turbulent place. And it was a place that had a lot of turmoil, fights between the Persians and the Romans, the Christians, the Jews. There was a lot going in Yemen, on in Yemen. At one point, the Christians had fell in submission to uh, Jews, and the Christians were being persecuted. So in Najashi, in Abyssinia, right, right in the most west part of Africa, or I'm sorry, east part of Africa, he gets word that the Christians of Yemen are being persecuted. So he cannot stand for this, he cannot, he will not have this. So he decides to send an Amir and a general to Yemen to remove the persecution from upon his people, from upon the Christians. The two people that he sends are an Amir by the name of Abiyal and a general by the name of Abraha. All right, so an Amir and a general by the name of Abraha. They get there, they do what they have to do, and they bring victory to their people. And they remove the Christians from persecution, and they actually take hold and take control of Ayyam. As time progresses, now Ayyam is the ruler over Yemen. He is reporting to a Najashi in Abyssinia. Abraha, who is the general, he doesn't really have a lot of respect for Ayyam. And he wants to take you know, his people and his uh, country or whatever, he wants to take it to the next level. So he starts to grow and plot and plan. He wants to fight and take over Ariel's position. So he grows his own little army until he's in a position to fight now, fully with Ariel. And when they meet Ariel and Abraham, they decide, you know what, let's fight between you and I. Whoever dies, that's it, and whoever wins will take over the complete rulership. They get into this fight, and Abraham wins. But Abraham in the fight becomes severely marred and cut up in his face. That's why he's known as Abraha and Ashram. And Ashram means someone who is marred and marred in his face. That's why he's known as Abraha and Ashram, because in that fight with Ariyal, he got cut up. So nonetheless, Abraha is someone who has high aspirations. And he wants to grow his people to the highest of heights. He sees what's happening in Mecca. He sees that the Meccan society is flourishing, he sees that the Kaaba is the city center, this place that has all of this fanfare, tra you know, trade routes and so on, for Jaj and idols and all of this stuff. It's something that he becomes extremely envious of, and he wants that growth. He wants that position. Now, when an Najashi gets word that Abraha killed his Amir, Ariyal, Najashi becomes very angry in Abyssinia. And he becomes irate and he screams and he yells and he says, I swear I will go to Yemen, I will stand on the dirt of Yemen, and I will step on the hair of Abraham. Right? To completely show him how dare he kill one of my own law. <laughs> so Abraham gets word of this. So he's very smart. He's loyal to Najash. He just wanted to overthrow Aliyah, but he's loyal to Najash and Abyssinia. So he sends a Najashi a package. And this package has dirt from Yemen, and it has locks of hair, his own hair. And he sends it to a Najashi in Abyssinia. And he says, my Sayyid, my Amir, my whatever, I have sent you this so that you can fulfill your oath. You swore that you would step on the dirt of Yemen, here is some dirt. And you swore you would step on my hair, here is my hair. And he said to him, he told his messenger that he sent with this package, he said, tell him, I am building for him a magnificent church. Something that will be the center of the world and everyone will flock to it. And it will be done in your honor, Yadajesh. 
Now Judge he sees this, hears this, and he's impressed. Says, all right, you know, this guy will keep you my life. So Abraham begins to build a kulais. It's called al kulais the thing, the structure of the church that he built is called al kulais And he built it out of extremely precious metals, gold, emeralds, all of what he had, the best of what he had, and it was magnificent. And he wanted it done quickly. So one of the things that the, in the books of Sira they say is that if you came to work late, your hand would be cut off. Abraham would cut your hand off if you came late because he was quick and he wanted it done. He had major aspirations that this would now rival the Kaaba, okay? That this structure will rival the Kaaba and everyone will turn their attention from the Kaaba and come to the Qulais. <clears throat> so, he builds the Qulais, he's bragging about it, he's, he feels he's done something magnificent, and word starts to spread. The Arabs in Yemen, there are Arabs in Yemen at that, that point, they hear that this is happening. So one man from the tribe of Kinan, he comes and he decides, you know what, you build this place, it looks majestic, it looks magnificent, you think this is a, a special place? He goes and he decides to defecate in the church, in the police. Defecates means to, you know, he did his deed. Some of the U.S. say that he takes whatever he did and he smears it on the walls of the church. Abraham comes the next day and he sees this. And he becomes irate. And he says, I swear, now I am absolutely dedicated to destroying the God. Right? I want us to pause here from because this is a part of the story that I don't think a lot of people are familiar with. And that is this. Abraha initially did not have in his intention to destroy the God. He initially intended to build this structure that would marvel and that would challenge the authority and the position of the God. But look, now he was driven by envy, he was driven by illusions of grandeur, he wanted position, he wanted growth, he wanted majesty, he wanted imperial pursuits, he wanted a lot of things, a lot of problematic things, there's no doubt. But it was the act of one man from the Arabs, from Kinana, that was the breaking point, if you will, that really drove him to now want to destroy the Kaaba. Brothers and sisters, you know, I personally read and have heard people, when they speak about this specific incident, they'll say things like, this is what the Arab had, this You know, this is what the Arab, they were, they would not fear anybody, they would go and definitely in a church. That's, that's, that's when the Arab had pride? Is that really something that is to be celebrated by any stretch of the imagination? Yes, he has some ball, he has some whatever. But what we don't understand is that his act, it was really one of the major driving forces for Allah to go now and have the resolve to destroy the Kaaba. And I want us to understand something here. That between Allah, who is one man, and between this Arab from Badu we don't know his name, they brought about a lot of evil into the world. And that evil, you know its primary source was? The disease of their hearts. The problem with their hearts and their minds. Ignorance. Abraham, we spoke last time about the danger of envy, correct? And we spoke about how it almost led the people of Arabia into death and destruction. Because of Abraham, we said that the Prophet said, Da'ul Umam, the disease of nations is al hasan wa al anger and mindless hatred. Abraha is diseased in many ways, and that will lead to absolute evil. But this man, in his act, and his ignorance, and his belligerence, and his idiocy, led also to a significant amount of evil to come about. And I say this, brothers and sisters, and I emphasize this because sometimes in, in world affairs, we tend to hyper focus ourselves on the people who are powerful. And we blame the people.
capable of power for all of the evil that exists in the world. And we sit there, we say, we are, we're very confident that we can point out oppressors. That person is an oppressor. That person is evil. Those people are this. These people are hegemonic. Those people are imperialistic. But we don't dedicate the proper amount of time to assessing how many of us are on the other side of the equation with that Arab man. That we act and conduct ourselves belligerently. And we act and conduct ourselves with idiocy. And we have a false sense of what honor looks like. This man was conducting himself believing that he was doing something honorable. That he was doing something that was of dignity. That I'm bringing pride to the people of the, Ara the Arabians. Whereas in reality, he brought devastation. Brothers and sisters, for us, it really saddens me when I see Muslims today, when they bring honor to things they think it takes place with belligerence, with anger, with obscenities, with being foul and arrogant. You know, the Prophet says, ليس المؤمن, the Muslim is not the ta'an, ولا اللعان, ولا الفاحش, ولا المدين. The Muslim is not someone who slanders. The Muslim is not someone who curses. The Muslim is not someone who is obscene. The Muslim is not someone who is foul. How can we think, and I see this even within religious communities, people think that as soon as they believe something, that they have given themselves the authority to insult and be arrogant towards others. People commonly ask, can we backbite young Muslims? Muslims don't backbite. Muslims are not Muslims. Why do you want to backbite Muslims? Are not Muslim. We don't. Back, we're not people of badaa. We're not people of obscenities. The Prophet sallallahu Quran. His character was the Quran. Inna ala khulqin azim. You are the best of character. The Prophet, Allah tells us about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Kana layyid. He was soft. He was a man of hikmah. Udhu ila sabili rabbika. Call to the way of your Lord. With hikmah, with wisdom, or with mawila al-hasana, and with the, the good mawila, the good reminder. If you're going to debate, so you're calling, you call him bil ladhi ahsan. If you're going to debate, then perfect how you debate. Choose your words. Allah tells the Prophet, لَوْ كُنْتَ فَضَّلْ غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَا فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِهِ If you were hard, and you were hard-hearted, they would have fled from you. So brothers and sisters, how can we think for a moment that we will be influential in our societies, in our homes? Some fathers walk around, some parents walk around as if they are emperors in their little home. Napoleonic complexes. They treat their wives and their children, yes, men, do this, as if they're abi, slaves. You know, we, we look at all of the oppressors in Syria and Egypt and all across the world in the U.S. and the Western power, and we ourselves are some of the greatest of oppressors in the world. Why do you think Allah Jalla why do you think we're taught in Allah la yughayyuna bi qawmin hatta yughayyuna bi anfusihim that Allah will not change the status of the people until they change that is, that is within their hearts. Because change and victory and success and goodness happens here first. One of our shiwa recently, when he was being asked about Syria and what's happening in Syria, he said, you know what Syria really needs? Syria needs Tawbah Rasulah. It needs the Muslims of the world to make Tawbah, to return to Allah. It needs many things. But what it really needs from each and every single one of us is that we rectify our conditions. We purify our hearts. We recognize that we are a part of the problem. If you conduct yourself with your family belligerently, with obscenities, if you speak to your neighbors obscenely, if you're arrogant and, and rough when you're driving and you're belligerent and you're harsh, all of that, that breeds negativity and that breeds evil. First and foremost, within myself and my relationship, and secondarily in society as a whole. So clearly if I alter my condition, Allah tells us and promises us, then the condition of your people will change. And this is an absolutely key lesson that we have to understand 
and we extract. So that's why what the Prophet says, well, I have not been sent except to perfect character. We realize the heightiness of character in a community. Brothers and sisters, monitor the way you speak, the way you act, how trustworthy you are, how truthful you are, how you treat your wife, how you treat your children. Brothers and sisters, uncles, aunts, treat your, each other well. Treat each other with character, with edam. If you're a bully in school or you see bullies in school, you're not someone who is proud of that. You don't sign yourself with a bully because the bully is powerful. I see someone who's strong, so I go over to them. Am, am I weak minded? No, I can stand, I can stand for what is righteous. This kind of character, this is what brings goodness. So I hope, inshallah, that we are mindful of how powerful the diseases of the heart are exemplified. There's a form of disease that is exemplified in Abraha. And there's a form of disease and ignorance that is exemplified in this man from Madam Kinana. And both are dangerous. And we have to be mindful of both. The story continues. So he says, so up on that, that point, he has, as we said, he has the resolve. And he wants to now destroy. So he gathers an army of 60,000. 60,000 soldiers. This is something that was unheard of. This number was a just a, a, a magical number in their minds. There's no way they could imagine they would see this. 60,000 and he brings 13 or 15 elephants. Now one thing you understand is that the Arabs were not familiar with elephants. Abraham was familiar because he had connections to Africa. So he's seen these in his travel. And he was going to bring these in as a tool for psychological warfare. I'm going to shock and awe the Arabs with these you know, uh, beast-like tanks, right? Massive, and, and they say that the biggest elephant was an elephant by the name of Mahmoud. This is the riwayat and Jamur of the say that the biggest elephant was an um, uh, elephant by the name of Mahmoud. Abraham proceeds, and he's going now towards the camel. His first, quote-unquote, hurdle is a man by the name of Dunafar and his tribe. He is a man who lives on the outskirts of Yemen and he decides to stand up. And he said he recognizes the intention of Abraha. He stands up with his people and they're all home. Abraha, of course, this is no, I mean, elephants, 60,000 soldiers, he bubbles the Nafa of his people. He keeps on going until his next stop. And that is with another tribe, now in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and the leader of this tribe is a man by the name of Nufayr ibn Habib al Khafari. Nufayr ibn Habib, keep this name in mind, Nufayr ibn Habib, stands. His people get killed. And he tells Abraha, Take me as a prisoner of war, I may be of benefit to you. Take me as a prisoner of war, I may be of benefit to you. So Abraha takes him. They continue. The next stop is Taif. Now Taif is south. Uh, southwest of Mecca, right? Kind of like this. They stop in Taif. Now in Taif, the leader of Taif is a man, man by the name of Masoud ibn Matib of Taif. At this point, something very unfortunate happens. So Masoud is obviously part of the Arabian Peninsula. He's one of the Arab tribes, one of the recognized Arab tribes. He sees Abraham coming. And he's like, this guy is going to destroy us. He runs out, he takes out, he goes out to where Abraham is stationed, and he tells Abraham, listen, we are your servants. We will do anything you want. Aslam, like, first and foremost, that house you're going to destroy, we don't really care about it, because we have our land. Now, I remember when I spoke about when Muhammad bin Ruhayn introduced idol worship, he brought Obed. And the next idols that were were brought into fruition after that, if you will, were Allah and then Ruzza and Manat. Allah, we said, was taken to Taif. So this is a couple of hundred years earlier. So at that point, Allah is a, is a you know, a built structure that has, uh, you know, air and space around it. It's, a, it's, a, it's an institution, if you will. And he says, we have our Allah. We don't even care about that house. That's not even the house that we really care about. And not only that, we're all in your service, me and my entire tribe. I will send with you a human GPS. A name by the name of Dhu uh, or Abu Ghal. He 
He'll know the Iranian Peninsula, he knows everything about Mecca, he'll take you to exactly where you need to go, so you have direct access to destroy. Now, obviously, there's a lot to be said here. I'm not going to say all of it, because I want to keep on thinking where the story. But brothers and sisters, this is really a point that we have to stop and reflect on. The fact that this man, the Saud, Ibn Matib, so treasonous, so ready and willing to sell himself, sell his soul, sell his virtues and his values and his principles for safety and security and his own personal interests. He has his own personal interests. He has his people. He is the saint of his people. They have their left. They have their own little thing going on. I don't want this to be disturbed. And so I don't disturb this I'm going to become treasonous. And I will sell myself for the cheapest of prices. He goes and he tells Abraha, Nahnu Ali, we are your slaves and your servants. This is something that's devastating, right? And we don't appreciate, you know, the motivations of people all too often, they come in this, this kind of exchange. What am I going to really stand by? And what am I going to give up? You know, there's this constant exchange happening in our mind. There's no doubt that as Muslims, we are under a lot of pressure in this society. Tremendous amount of pressure. And our virtues and our values and our principles are constantly in question. Hijab, beard, look, masjid. Do you go? How many times do you bring the masjid? You do, you do this, you don't hang out with girls, you don't go there, you don't have girlfriends. All of these things are constantly in question. Whether it's through, through direct threats or through social pressure. There's plenty of social pressure that is telling us not to believe in what we believe in, but when we believe in it. If you're going to be a Muslim, you know, just cool down a little bit. We want you to water down your Muslim to, to here so that I can swallow it. But these kind of uptight Muslims, you guys really, you know, you're really religious, not even with a message and stuff, that's, well, that's pretty heavy. You really don't, you know, you don't have a girlfriend? That's odd. I mean, I, all of us experience this, especially growing up in this country. From high school to college to even in the workplace, right? From, the, from, from, from high school to the workplace, you're always constantly in question. And we find ourselves always trying to make this negotiation. Little kids will ask their parents, can I do this, can I do this, can I do this, can I do this? And their parents don't want them to do it. But you know what? Well, maybe they're going to look weird, so I'll let them do it. I'll let them go here, I'll let them go there, I'll let them dress this way. Let them dress this way, it's fine, it's good for them. You know, I'll let them dress this way, and because they'll fit in better. Brothers and sisters, these kind of negotiations we make, things that we have to be very careful. And we should never, for a moment, never, sell ourselves short. Never, as the Prophet says in the hadith about the signs of the times, that he sells or she sells their deen for the world, for a part of the world. What is that part of the world that I sell my deen for? Because I'm intimidated or scared? Or because I want something? I want some benefit? I want some growth? I want some notoriety? I don't want to be with God as a weirdo? So are we ready and willing to sell our virtues and our principles for that cause? We have to be very mindful. And that's why when Allah in the Quran talks to us about a tijara that is a, a really fruitful tijara, fruitful business, should I direct you towards a tijara business that will preserve you from what is important and that is preserve you from falling into jahannam, the great punishment? Believe in Allah and His Messenger. And strive and struggle in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the bayah, the transaction that is fruitful, that is beneficial, that we should be engaging in. And let us never, inshaAllah, we beg Allah to never allow us to be weak, where we sell our virtues, we sell ourselves, we sell our deen, we sell our principles for any part of this dunya. Let us beg Allah that He allows us to die while we are haqqan al-Islam, that we are salihin al 
that we believe 110% that Allah is our Creator, and with Him belongs all forces and all might. And no person or no thing will ever, no pressure, will ever take me away from him. We ask Allah to make us our Lord, inshaAllah. Abu Ghal, the human GPS, takes Abu Ghal towards Mecca. And they settle in this place known as Mughamas. In Mughamas, or Mahmas, Abu Ghal settles, Abu Ghal, the GPS, he dies there. And for centuries after that, his grave became a place where the Arabs would go and throw rocks and throw animal intestines and feces and I don't know what else out of dishonor to him. They would desecrate him because of his uh, treason. So as Abu Abba is sitting in his tent, there are various reviews of how this occurrence actually happened. I'm not going to get into all the details. But basically, Abraha and Abdul Muttalib meet. All right? There are various. Did Abdul Muttalib seek out Abraha, or did Abraha seek out a Sharif, a dignified member of the Mecca society? Then they both are there. I don't want to get into that. Both traditions are there. But nonetheless, they meet. When Abdul Muttalib enters into the uh, place or the space where Abraha is sitting, Abraha is sitting high in his throne. And I was leaving. When Abu sees Abu Muttalib, he cannot but be awed by the presence of Abu Muttalib. He is shocked by the hiba, the, the, the awe of Abu Muttalib. So much so that he says, I have to come down and I have to sit next to Abu Muttalib. I cannot sit up here while this distinguished, this dignified man is sitting on the floor. So he goes and he sits next to him. He says to him, what are your needs? He says, Abu Muttalib, what are your needs? Abu Muttalib says, now, obviously 60,000 soldiers sitting in camp around Mecca, idle hands, you know, idle hands, get into messy business. So they go and some of his soldiers have stolen 200 of Abu Muttalib's camels. So Abu Muttalib tells Abu Muttalib, he says, well, um, I have 200 camels, and they were stolen, and I want you to return them to me. Abraha becomes almost offended. I'm about to destroy your home, your sacred home, and you're asking me about 200 camels? Then, Abu Muttalib utters words that have become, you know, very famous. He says, I am the custodian of these ibn, these camels. وَيَلْبَيْتِ رَبُّ يَحْمِيهِ and the house of Allah has a Rabb, a Lord that will protect it. Say him now, he will defer you, he will reject you. Right? I am custodian over my 200 camels. The bait is of Allah's house, and he will protect it. Abraha arrogantly responds, saying, Lam yakun yamna'i. He will not deny me. Because Abraha, in his mind, I am remarkably powerful. And clearly, for all of the Arabs, he is a force. Right? That's an unstoppable wrecking train. When Abu Muttalib leaves that gathering with Abraha, he goes to the Kaaba. And he says a, a, a poetry, but he says it in a, it's a dua, it's a form of dua, supplication. He says, Lahum, Allahum, inna al marta yamna wihla, that al marta, the man amongst us, we protect our homes. Famna al hala, protect your home, ya Allah. لا يغلبن صليبهم ومحالهم أبدا محال. That do not, do not allow for a moment, Ya Allah, that their salib, their cross, Abraha is a Christian, their cross, do not allow their cross and their power, their wrath, to ever, they will never, ever hand their cross and their power overcome your power. And then he leaves, and he orders the people of Mecca to go into the mountains of Mecca, to flee, obviously, because he knows the death and destruction is coming, and there is no virtue in him having his people die. So he takes that very profound stand against Abraha, where he tells him clearly where he stands, and that is, Allah will protect his home. I'm a man of belief. And by the way, I mean, a lot of discussion has happened in the books about Abdul Muttalib. Was he a hanif? Was he a person who believed purely in Allah or not? I don't want to get into all of that detail, but there is no doubt that Abdul Muttalib was a virtuous man. 
and a man of great principle and a man of iman. He had belief, right? And he had a strong relationship with Allah. You see that when he made the promise with Allah, he himself is the one who was driven to fulfill it. And in this regard, he tells Abba Habili, Allah will protect his home. So when they flee to the mountains, Abraham now prepares his army and tells them, full speed ahead, go and destroy the Kaaba. And this everyone knows famously what had happened. But some of the points just to kind of remind everybody is that the major elephant, Mahmoud, and all of the elephants would not move. Some of the narrations say that Ufayl, that man who was one of the tribe leaders, who was taken as a prisoner of war, went to Mahmoud, this major camel, and said, Ubruk ya Mahmoud, this is the house of Allah, and I'm destroyed. And so Mahmoud listened. And the Prophet later on says that Habisa uh, Habis Sufi, when his own camel was well, stopped moving during Hudaybiyah, that he told the Sahaba, Habisa Habis Sufi, the one who restricted my camel is the one who restricted the elephant. But nonetheless, the elephant would not move. The soldiers rush, and Allah Jalla Ala sends Ayyad al Abil, these uh, birds. And these birds, they have in their mouths and in their two claws, they have lentil sized baked clay rocks. And what the Riwayah tells us is that when the clay would hit one of their heads, it would exit from their backside. And they would literally disintegrate. They would literally disintegrate. is like some of the tests she had, or some of the imagery that was given to really explain this was if you've ever eaten sugar cane, when you're done, you know, sucking out all the juices, you have that dry, straw like substance that's left over, that that's what happened to them. They became like this dry straw. There's a lot that took place, and they. Allah had the people of Mecca see this. Now I want you to envision what's happening here. The people of Mecca, they're in the mountains of Mecca, but they see this happening in front of them like a movie. They see the birds coming with the stones, the elephants not moving, the soldiers disintegrating. It becomes the event of the century. So much so that it is known as Amrfi. It is the year of the elephant. And they organized their calendar around this year. So if you look at the books of Sia, they'll say, Abu Bakr was born three years after Amrufi. And this person was born five years after, before Amrufi. And so many years after, everything surrounded Amrufi. Everyone amongst the Arabs knew about Amrufi. Everyone knew that it happened. Everyone experienced it, and everyone saw it. And there was no denying it, right? So you see that Allah is preparing them psychologically, clearly, for something is going to happen. First, Zamzam. That is their first kind of experience. Then, the incident of Abdul Muqallid and Abdullah, where they become friendly, and something is unique about these people. Then, the stance of Abdul Muqallid with Abraha, and then clearly Allah's presence is absolutely undeniable. Allah, before the coming of the Prophet, but there is no way, we've never seen anything like this, clearly something is here. Allah's presence was purely established. And that's why Allah says in the Quran, tara fa'ala Each one of these words, we can do an entire lesson just on each one of the words of Surah al fi Adam tara infers, in this sense, infers continuity. Everyone, have not seen, have not known. Kayfa fa'ala kayfa, kayfa infers is profound. Have you not seen what we've done? Like if someone does something substantial, haven't you seen what I've done? Allah, fa'ala, fi'alullah. The fi'ala of Allah is extremely different from the fi'ala of the Bashar. Because human beings, the fi'ala of the Bashar, the action of humans, is restricted to human laws. But the fi'ala of Allah supersedes all of these man-made laws, all of these laws that are on earth. And so when Allah clearly puts himself in the equation, you see the fi'ala of Allah not the fi'al of Bashar. There is no human who can do what Allah has done. There is no human, none amongst you can do what Allah has done. Notice, see, recognize, open up your eyes to the magnificent power of the Creator. That's what's being told to them. أَلَمْ تَرَى كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُكَ بِأَصْحَانِ أَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ كَيْدَهُمْ فِي قَبْلِي The word يَجْعَلْ, when used in the Arabic language, 
Usually, it comes after someone has done something. So someone has done something, فَجَعَلْتُكَ I made that thing that was done this way. The, the Mufassirin speak beautifully about this. So one of the things that they say is that Allah Jalla wa Ala, when people are plotting, especially plotting against him and his deen, and plotting against whatever, Allah gives them a lot of reach. Plot as much as you want. And all of this body and all of this planning that you've done, Abraham, armies, this, that, the building of the Quraysh, all of these things, Jahana, Allah turned it into Tawil, nothingness. Kun Fayyakun, it was done. All of that he had planned was thrown on the floor and meant nothing. Brothers and sisters, the lessons that can be taken away from this incident are meant. But for our sake, number one, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He Himself preserves His deen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who will preserve His deen. Inna alayna jama'ahu wa quran. Allahu ghalibu ala amri. Allah is the one who protects His affairs. He is the one who controls His affairs. Brothers and sisters, I mentioned this briefly last time, but we have to understand it again. Allah will always protect His deen. His deen is protected. What is not protected are Muslims. At that moment, the Kaaba represented the divine presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In many, for all intents and purposes, they represented divinity. And so Allah protected it. But there are other times when the Kaaba was destroyed. Other parts of Islamic history, the Kaaba was destroyed. But Muslims were there. A hikmah that Allah Azza wa Jal in this moment preserved the Kaaba. But there's also another reason in the Mufassirun and the Ulama of Siyah say this. This happened 50 days before the birth of the Prophet The Prophet was in the womb of Amina, and Amina was a member of Mecca. So if it were to happen that Abu Rahab would actually take control and destroy and take the women as the war would be, then what would have happened? Then Amina herself, Allah was not just protecting the Kaaba, He was protecting his deen by protecting Amina and protecting Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the baby in her womb. <sighs> I want to close on this note, inshaAllah. Um, Sayyidina Ibrahim made a dua. We didn't mention this last time, but Sayyidina Ibrahim made a dua. He made a dua. He said, Rabbi Jal Hadha Baladan Amina, Warzuqa Ahla. Allah Jalla wa Ala, when He's speaking to the Kufar in these last surah of Quran, especially in Feed and Umas and so on, He's telling them, I responded to the call of Ibrahim. And Allah made it that Mecca was a safe place, never colonized, always a safe place. Warzaqam, and Allah gave them. They became very wealthy people, and they had all the sustenance that they need. They needed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them that security that they wanted. And Allah is now challenging them, telling them, I have shown you everything that you need to see. Will you submit? Will you now obey? With the coming of the Prophet wasallam, will you submit? This is the question. This is what is going to happen. Allah is making, them, making it happen that there is no excuse. I am going to bring you the Prophet. Are you going to Obey or not? Are you going to heed the call of Allah and His Messenger or not? This is the, the kind of inferred question that is present. Last week, someone after the death asked me a question. I don't know if he's here, but he asked me about the issue of miracles. And he asked me, you know, he heard when Abu Qadid kind of had this dream about Zemzam. He's like, you know, can we have similar miracles? Can we, you know, it would be nice to have those kind of miracles and see those kind of things. But something is very important to recognize this regard. Brothers and sisters, Allah Jalla wa Ala, He sends miracles for specific purposes. He sends ayah for specific purposes. And every people have been sent the miracles and the ayah that they need to see. Shaykh Shah always says this. You know, people ask about all of the various miracles. He says, he says something very beautiful. He says, we obsess so much about those miracles. We believe that they existed. But one thing we're mindful of is that those miracles were for those people to see. Clearly, every people have their miracle. 
Brothers and sisters, we undoubtedly have a miracle. And the miracle that we have is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't need to sit here and wait for you know, magical anything or birds or stones or anything. None of that. That is not for the Ummah of Iqra. The Ummah of Iqra, Iqra, this is Rabbi Kalani Khalaq, Khalaq, and it's the Iqra, Allah, 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 the Ummah of Re, the Ummah that has been taught by a pen, we are an Ummah that Allah addresses our intellects. And so our miracle is in the Qur'an. And the Qur'an is definitely miraculous. And the challenge that Allah places in the Qur'an, bring ten surah, bring one surah like this, no one has met that challenge. Is that not miraculous? And that's just a part of the miracle of the Qur'an. The Qur'an is miraculous in many, many, many ways. The point is not whether we will see miracles or not, because understand this. Allah showed when we saw eight miracles. And He showed Sayyidina Isa's people miracles. And He showed the people of Quraysh miracles. Did everyone believe? No. Not everyone believed, but us. That not, it was not the case in all those situations. Many people did not believe, even when they saw the miracle with their eyes. Brothers and sisters, it's not about can we have miracles like that. The miracle is present and standing. It's a matter of are we ready to see the miracle of Allah? Are we qualified and are we capable of seeing the miracle of Allah? The miracle of Allah is very present. It's a matter of us conditioning and preparing and teaching ourselves and following the prophetic, prophetic footsteps, submitting to Allah and His Messenger so that we can be exposed to the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So brothers and sisters with this, I hope inshallah the lessons from these three events are clear. I hope we see the progression and how Allah step by step took the people of Quraysh and then ultimately not only the people of Quraysh but all of the surrounding region because Abraha, I forgot to mention this, Abraha was actually hit with one of those stones and he returns to Yemen. Allah allows us that he is physically well enough, his entire path back to Yemen, he was falling apart, he was disintegrating. When he arrived in Yemen, Abraha arrived in Yemen, people literally see him disintegrate, that his body cavity falls out. And Allah preserved Abraha, just like he preserved Sharam till today. He preserved Afra for the people of Yemen to see. And the people of Yemen were from all over the place, from the Roman Empire, from the Persian Empire. So that event, not only did it shock the region, but it was an earthquake that was felt across the world. <coughs> Allah was preparing the earth for something very specific. He was preparing for a very specific message. And inshallah, we will uh, delve into that in the coming lessons. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us um, our gathering. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us beneficial knowledge. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us what we are doing and may He grant us beneficial knowledge. And He make us of those who love the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the Quran the light of our hearts in this life and the next. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us constantly to what is righteous. We ask Allah to make beloved to our hearts that which is good and righteous and make hated to our hearts that which is wretched and evil. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who love Iman and Islam and hate kufr and fusuq and isyan, disbelief. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who are with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the afterlife. We want, Ya Allah, to be amongst those who are followers, who are true followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that on the day of judgment, when we come and we run to the Prophet, and we say, Ya Rasulullah, we are from your ummah, he is able to embrace us, and we are not amongst the people who are shy away from the Prophet, because the angels tell them you are, they are not truly from your ummah, Ya Rasulullah. We ask Ya Allah to make us steadfast on our deen. Ya Muqalli bal Qulub. This is one of the greatest of the day of the Prophet. Ya Muqalli bal Qulub thabbit qalbi ala deen. O Allah, the one who transforms in the state of the heart, make steadfast my heart on your deen, Ya Allah. Because brothers and sisters never think that our deen is secure. Allah can take it whenever He wants. He said, the Muhammad, I love Him. He can replace us with anyone else. Preserve your deen. Preserve your relationship with Allah. Preserve your relationship with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And let us preserve our relationship with the Book of Allah Jalla Ala. Zakiwa Khair.